Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Um, it's very nice to be back here. I've been here several times since then, but the first time I came here was in 1985 when I did my internship for my in, uh, MSc in uh, Wageningen. Um, I, I don't recognize anybody uh, anymore, but <laughs> could be that one or two of you were there at that time. Um, yeah, as, as Jan already introduced, um, this will be a, a broader perspective. And I deliberately stay away from, say, more the farm level studies, as that was, I think, extensively treated by, uh, by Ken. And in that way, the two talks nicely complement each other. Um, future half. So it's, it's, uh, what I would like to start with is, is a global long-term perspective on whether we can feed the world. That will be the first half of the presentation. And then the sec that's more an analytical story, I would say, that we, we put together with an interdisciplinary team of scientists from Wageningen University. Um, and then the second half will be five um, topics that I take and I'll give examples of research projects that I'm uh, running at the moment with my uh, group, in our group, Plant Production Systems, uh, which are relevant for this long-term perspective. And then I will end with some concluding methodological slides that in fact make the point that integrated assessment is something that we need to deal with these long-term but also the more shorter-term integrated problems that we are facing. But first, will mankind have enough to eat, the global and the long-term perspective? Well, I think this is nothing new. Can, can you see this? It's a bit light here, but you can see the line. Yeah. Okay. So for the second time in the last uh, 10 years, um, prices are peaking, about a factor two to three higher than they were at the beginning of this millennium. And um, well, of course, this is in the daily news and it's, it's, um, it's affecting many things, perhaps including the unrest, political unrest in some countries in, uh, in the Middle East. Um, but the question here is on the, on the agricultural side, are we facing a trend break? They are very remarkable, these price peaks, given the historical evolution of, for instance, uh, cereal prices as, we're, uh, as we drafted in this graph. You could say ever since around 1875, if you look at normalized uh, wheat prices, the trend has been downwards. There have been peaks in between, but these were always caused by exogenous factors like wars, First war, World War, Second World War. Um, but the general trend has been downward. The question is, are we facing a new trend? Until roughly the start of the Industrial Revolution, uh, hunger was a problem of poverty and scarcity. Since then, uh, hunger ha became a problem of poverty amidst plenty. And the question is whether we are facing a trend break and whether the poor will uh, once more suffer from an absolute scarcity of food at global level. Well, we all know that the demand for food will increase drastically in the next uh, decades. Um, there are different projections for that, I will come back to that. But the three main factors are the rise in the population, the increase in demand for animal products, a, a very good relationship between economic growth and uh, uh, consumption of animal proteins, and the um, looming bio-based economy, you could say, um, it's very hard to express and to project how much that will take from our uh, agricultural production, but if only you take this figure, if the total energy consumption, if we take that of today, you take 10% of that, if you would translate that into agriculture production, it's, it's more than our current global production from agriculture. So it's, it's potentially a huge demand. Of course, not everything will come from agriculture, but just to, to make the point how much it can be. So this global requirements will increase drastically. And, and to simplify, you could say, OK, in the, in the poor countries, this is due to population growth and due, due to the present poor diets. So we'll, they will need more food. In the middle income countries, it's mainly because of economic growth, which increases demand for animal products and which increases the demand for the bio-based economy. And in the rich countries, it's mainly the bio-based economy which increases the demand for food, for agriculture products, products. That's the demand side. If we now look at the 
if we try to quantify this and then later look at the, the production side, but first quantify this demand side, if you express everything, the current agriculture production in grain equivalents, so we translate all agriculture production, including grassland production, into grain equivalents, then the current production you could estimate at about 7 billion grain equivalents. The mainstream projection for 2050, taking into account those factors, mainly the, the food and the feed requirements, then the, the projection is that it will increase with about 70%. So it will decrease from 7 to 12 billion grain equivalents. If the, uh, the bio-based economy really takes off, and it, it has started already, and we would indeed um, uh, produce about 10% of the global energy supply uh, from agriculture products, it would increase to 17. And then finally, if all people in the world would consume a European diet, which is not in this projection, still much lower than that, then we would add I mean, it's cumulative, the total would be 23. Now, these are two, of two hypothetical scenarios. We don't know whether that will happen. Perhaps we should hope it will not happen. But this is very likely that it will happen. So, it, in any case, it means a drastic increase in the demand. In itself, such an increase in the demand is not something new. We have experienced this before. If we look 50 years back, say from 1960 onwards, the population has increased from 3 to 6 billion in about um, 40 to 50 years. And in that period, we managed to increase the yields of, for instance, the rice crop um, with about 2% per year. And the same was true for wheat and for many other crops. This was, um, of course, partly due to new cultivars, it was due to uh, irrigation of crops, and it was due to an increase in chemical fertilizer. This is this curve. Remarkably, in the same period, the uh, use of agriculture area has gone up with only about 10%, so quite modest. So you could say in the past 50 years we have managed to, uh, in fact, increase the food production per capita, despite the huge growth of the number of people, um, hardly because of an increase in agriculture area, mainly because of an increase in productivity. So is this possible again? Well, one thing is for sure, the conditions right now are very different than those in the 1960s. The low-hanging fruits have been plucked, so we'll, ha we'll have to look at more difficult solutions probably. First question, is it possible to expand the agriculture area at a global scale? It was not a major factor until now, only 10%, but will it be and should it be a major factor in the future? Well, potentially it can. Um, this is the uh, current cropland, about 1.6 billion hectares right now and um, 3.4 billion hectares of grassland. But potentially it could increase with about 60%. And, and a lot of that land is potentially also suitable for, for cropping not just for grassland. But much of this extra 60% is under valuable ecosystems, including rainforests. Um, the many more people will need land for their housing, for industry, for recreation, etc. And much of that extra land is also lower in quality in for agriculture purposes. So I would say, but of course this is, is we can discuss about this. I would say it's not very desirable that we are going to exploit this extra 60%, at least not much of it. And the way forward is again a productivity increase to meet this future demand. But how is it possible to increase the agriculture production that much to satisfy the future demands? Well, these concepts, what we call the production ecological concepts, allow us to calculate, to quantify how much slack there still is in the system in terms of productivity increase. Potential production, that's the production level in which the management in fact is perfect. There is no water, no nutrient stress and no reducing factors due to pests and diseases. The water and nutrient limited level is when you have stress from water and or uh, nutrients and the actual production level there also weeds, pests and diseases or pollutants play a role. 
we can quantify these different yield levels through using crop growth simulation models and then quantify the yield gap or the yield gap closure. The yield gap closure is defined as the actual production level as observed on farms through surveys or whatever statistics over the potential production level and that ratio gives you the yield gap closure. Now through quantifying that yield gap closure all around the globe and making a number of assumptions uh, and these are the assumptions we keep the current agricultural land area so we don't expand we assume multiple cropping per year wherever possible on the globe in terms of growing uh, in terms of climate uh, uh, conditions assuming a maximum of 80 percent yield gap closure everywhere in the world 80 percent is thought to be about the maximum that can be realized by farmers, so not 100% but 80%, and assuming that the net effect of climate change would be zero, then we can calculate, and it's, I will help, it's a bit difficult to read I think, but the potential would be about 36 billion tons of grain equivalents. That will require a lot of extra water. Theoretically that water is available, but of course also for water there's huge competition between different uh, um, users. So if we make the assumption that the irrigated land would increase with a maximum of 50%, the estimation comes down to 27 billion tons of grain equivalents. Now if we compare that again to the table that I've shown before, you can see that 26 versus the 12, I mean it's, it seems possible theoretically. If we go to the most extreme scenario in which all people have a European diet with more meat, etc., and a bio-based economy, then the, the difference is really, really very small and it's getting close. But one thing is for sure, there is still a lot of potential, a, a lot of slack in the system. But how will that work in reality? Will that be enough? And I will come back to that question, but first, that's the potential of our current crops, you could say our current cultivars and our current animals. Is it possible maybe to stretch that a bit, the production, uh, potential production level? There are some options there. Um, first of course we could think of breeding for new cultivars with higher potential yields. Well, if you look at the moment at the major crops, you can see a stagnation in the potential yield levels. It's still going up a bit for maize, uh, wheat and rice, but it's, it's leveling off. It's not going very fast anymore. And if we want to breed for higher potential yields, we will have to increase the biomass production now, rather than the, uh, improving the harvest index. And uh, improving the biomass production is much more complicated from a breeding point of view, from a physiological point of view, then changing the harvest index. So I think it's not very rosy and not very likely that in the near future we will have major progress there. Improving conversion efficiencies, uh, for instance the conversion of plant products in animal products or different types of animals which are more favorable in terms of conversion. A lot is possible there in efficiency gains um, and a nice study um, on that, I always find um, of uh, Stefan Virsenius, if I pronounced it correctly, from Gothenburg. He did a very nice global study on that, on, on how much variation there is in conversion efficiencies of different livestock systems in the world. Biorefinement is another one which could make conversion processes more efficient. And of course we could go beyond land for, um, to produce our food and we have sea farms produce uh, fish or algae uh, on water and there is um, yeah, quite a bit of work starting up on that um, and there are possibilities but again it seems to be a very long-term perspective and the question is to what extent we can manage those systems in terms of nutrients and other issues. Finally food losses is a major issue um, it's, there are very coarse estimations for this um, you find figures of 30 to 40 and even higher percent of, of the food that is lost either because of uh, post-harvest losses, mainly in the developing countries, or because of um, waste, in fact, in the kitchen, uh, in the supermarkets, uh, in the restaurants, etc., uh, which is mainly the case in developed countries. But a lot of food is wasted. So these are 
possibilities to, let's say, uh, stretch the yield potential or make sure that more of the production really is, can be consumed. But for each of them, it's, it's not very likely that there will be major contributions to be expected in the next 10 or 20 years. So indeed, much of the productivity increase will have to come, uh, much of the future demand will have to be satisfied from productivity increase. But so far, it was a purely technical story. And you might say, yeah, this is all nice and fantastic. But where is the reality? I mean, we're facing all kinds of problems which make that currently we're not realizing potentials. And, and indeed, this is true. And, and the, well, one of the main factors is, of course, that in reality, farmers are not output, output maximizers, but profit maximizers. You can look at, at agriculture production from an economic point of view in this way. Uh, if we look here at the outputs on the y-axis and the inputs aggregated in some way, and it could be energy or a, a different unit, but let's say for uh, kilograms of, of, of wheat, and here on the horizontal axis is the use of energy, and it's the total of inputs, human-controlled energy. Then there are different types of options for a farmer. Um, with, let's say, lower tech options or organic uh, agricultural options or the, the, the green lev revolution options or maybe even hypothetical future options, different curves uh, representing these different options. They are discontinuous because there is synergy between the different inputs and there are jumps in productivity and in energy use if you go from one type of system to the other. It's not a continuous curve. Economic theory tells us that the profit for a farmer is maximum where we look at the line with a slope of the input-output price ratio, so the, um, the ratio of input prices over the output prices, and where that has the maximum intercept with the y-axis, with the production axis. So the higher the prices, so the steeper the curve, um, or maybe the other way around, the lower the input prices, so the more flat the curve, you will opt, the farmer will opt for the higher production levels. And if the curve of the line gets steeper, so higher input prices, you will go down, you move down to lower uh, curves, uh, production options with lower production levels. And this is often the case in many places in the world where inputs are expensive relative to the outputs and farmers economically have to opt for lower production um, um, systems with lower outputs. So using that theory, that you can say that in less favored areas, higher input-output price ratios determine that farmers will opt not for the maximum yield levels, but for lower yield levels. The other thing is that closing yield gaps requires research. And there are two factors. First, the investments in agriculture research have, have stagnated very significantly over the past decades. And secondly, the most easy solutions have been found. So it's getting more and more complicated uh, to increase productivity in many places. So that's another factor why uh, closing the yield gap is not that easy. And finally, the depletion of natural resources, for instance fossil fuels, for instance phosphorus, make that the ratios between inputs and output prices are going to increase, which will stimulate farmers not to opt for the high production levels, but for the lower production levels, at least in the, in the more difficult um, regions of the world. So supply becomes tight long before technical potentials have been exhausted. And, in that and then, with this theory, the difference between what is theoretically possible and the demand is really um, something to worry about. So it might indeed be the case that we are facing a trend change. Um, and then I will not elaborate on that here, but um, we have argued in a paper that then specifically the transition phase will be experiencing large fluctuations. So we could explain from economic theory why today we are indeed experiencing very high prices. Next year they might be low again like they were in 2009, after the peak in 2008. Uh, but the trend could very well be that indeed the prices go up.
there's one thing that I should mention here also why why this could happen, and that is I think because we think because policymakers and society have become myopic in the sense that prices were going down and prices have been low for agriculture products over the past decades, which in fact made um, policymakers to think that okay let's not worry about agriculture production we don't have to invest in it and as you all know you have to invest years and years in advance in research before you can pick the fruits later on pluck the fruits later on so that myopic behavior has really um, um, stimulated this this price trend okay that's the the global and long-term perspective and i will now give some uh, examples of research that we're doing in several research projects which are either on the long term also or on, on shorter term or considering uh, farm regional and global issues first the yield gap closure um, these are examples different studies around the globe of how big the the yield gap or how the yield gap closure can be um, on the one extreme kenya or africa in general i should say generally their yield gaps Closures are often around 20% of the water limited yield level. So a huge yield gap still remaining. In the Netherlands, US, on the other extreme, it's around this 80%. These are average figures, um, but it's very interesting to look at the variation in a population of farms in a region. And in this table, we are comparing for four regions in Southeast Asia. Um, the average, what average farmers achieve in terms of rice yield in the dry season. This is the yield level and this is the yield gap closure. So between 45 and 70 percent. If you now look in the same population what best farmers achieve, that's something between 12 and 28 percent higher than what the average farmers achieve. And then there's the next step. If you look at what these farmers use in terms of inputs, nitrogen fertilizer, labor um, you can see that in quite a few cases the use of nitrogen fertilizer is not much higher and the use of labor is also not higher or even lower than of the average farmers so it's interesting that best farmers not necessarily use more nitrogen and not necessarily use more labor in two out of the four regions you could also observe that schooling was much higher for the best farmers than uh, for the average farmers. This was not the case in the Philippines and in Thailand, but in Indonesia and Vietnam it was. So learning from variation and doing this yield gap analysis in a farming system context and using the socio-economic context in which the farmers are operating can be a very powerful start for redesigning agriculture systems. And that's the central topic that we're uh, taking today in um, uh, a, a project that we're starting up um, with Americans to make a global yield gap atlas. So not just calculating the yield gap, but then also the factors underlying the yield gap. As, uh, and, and to do that at a global scale and use that as a starting point for agricultural um, redesign and, and interventions. I'll skip the animal production here. Um, a slide on yield gaps of organic agriculture. We did a meta-analysis of, of about 400 data sets from the literature and looked at the uh, yield gap between conventional and organic agriculture and we found that this yield gap was about 22 percent on an average. So organic agriculture generally produ uh, average producing 22 percent less than conventional agriculture. But a lot of variation as you can also see. We then thought, well, maybe when conventional yields are higher, for instance in Europe, the US, it's more difficult to, to say, achieve the same yields with organic agriculture. So you have to use more, and the, the crop needs to be more free of nitrogen and water stress and uh, no pests and diseases, so that it will be more difficult to achieve under organic farming. So perhaps the gap will increase when the yields of conventional agriculture goes up. Well, you can see here for wheat, it, it is true, it is the case, but there's a lot of variation, it's not a very strong relationship, and we didn't find the relationship for all crops. So it's not very, it, the hypothesis holds to some extent, but it's not very strong. 
What I have to say here is that the yield gap is 22% on an average at the crop level. But of course, if we look at the systems level, we will need in some way to consider that the inputs, the, the, in particular the nitrogen and the phosphorus, ha will have to come from somewhere. And that means that we need to include legumes in the systems and or animal manure. And if we consider those two factors, I, I strongly think that the yield gap will become much bigger than the 22%. And this, in fact, is a, is a link to Ken's presentation. A second topic is on phosphorus scarcity. Um, I think you've all read about this in, in magazines and, and maybe also scientific articles that uh, prospects on the amount of phosphorus which is still available and which can be mined, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's end, uh, ending at some states. And first, um, and this is one example, we thought about 30, 40 years of, of uh, stocks left. Uh, since then, discussion has focused on how much phosphorus is still available, how much is there still to be mined, and now expectations are um, varying a lot between 40 and 300 years that could still be available. But one thing is for sure, it's, it's, uh, it's finite. There's no, it's not endless amounts that are available, so we need to become more efficient and we need to think about how much uh, phosphorus do we need to feed the world. That was a topic in... Um, in, in another project that we are currently doing. What we did here is uh, first, from the FAO statistics and from average concentrations of phosphorus in, in the crops, we plotted here the uh, application of phosphorus in time through fertilizer and through manure at European level, this one, and here for, African, for Africa. And this is the uptake in all the crops that are grown in Europe. And this is entire Europe, excluding the eastern part of Europe. And you can see that the phosphorus application has gone down dramatically, while the uptake continued to increase, or it's coming to a plateau, but certainly it did not decrease. For Africa, it has been low all the time. Not a strong trend. Now this trend for Europe I mean, is very strong, but similar patterns you can observe in the US and you can also start to observe in, uh, in Asia and in, um, in Latin America. We took, um, we thought, well, how is this possible? How, how can we explain this pattern? And then um, we thought about the importance perhaps of residual phosphorus. When you apply a kilo of phosphorus fertilizer to a crop, in the first year, about 20% roughly is taken up by the crop, but 80%, much of that, stays in the soil as residual uh, P, and it's, it's uh, bound to the soil particles at in, in some way. But this 80%, unless you have serious erosion or a runoff, will not be lost, and the crops can benefit from that in the future. So we use that, that thinking in a simple model with two pools uh, of phosphorus, and we were indeed able to explain, and that is the curve here, the uptake curve, ex well, quite, quite well, the, uh, the pattern of uptake because of historical applications of P through fertilizer and manure. And using that model, we were also able to predict, to forecast, well, not to predict, I would say, but to explore the future and see how much phosphorus we would need to feed the world in 2050 taking a millennium assessment scenario. And that's indicated here. And you can see that, in fact, around 2050, we would end up with a kind of equilibrium fertilization. We can apply as much phosphorus as is taken up by the crops. Of course, this cannot continue. So around that year, we will have to adjust again and maybe increase the phosphorus application a little bit. But it shows that um, we will, we will not have to apply for Europe, at least, that much phosphorus as we did in the past. For Africa, the situation is different, of course, because there we still have to build up the phosphorus stocks in the soils, and the two curves are diverging. So we will have to apply much more than is taken up by the crop. But if you look at the global level, the situation is actually that the uptake is increasing stronger than the necessary application. So from that point of view, Phosphorus is, is indeed a cause for concern, but perhaps less so than um, 
people would think by just extrapolating from the past. Climate change, I will speed up a bit. Um, I think many of you are aware of that, that in Northern Europe this may not be a very dramatic factor for, for farmers. At least if we look at the average increases in temperature and the changes in rainfall and taking into account the CO2 concentrations for the Netherlands, for Sweden, um, I think on an average the farmer will not bother a lot about this. Maybe it could even be positive. But extreme events, weather events, might be an issue. Extreme um, thunderstorms, hailstorms, periods of drought as we are experiencing this spring. Um, could be an issue and that's the, exactly the topic that we try to investigate in projects right now. Another thing that we try to do is to look at climate change in a more integrated perspective. When climate change will be real and, and really a serious factor in 2050, it's not just the climate that has changed, but it's also the whole market, political situation, technology will have changed, farms will have changed. So we'll, we're looking at different scenarios how farms may change into the future and then try to estimate how f whether we'll have more production or multifunctional oriented farms or more farms with nature development, smaller, bigger farms, what is the proportion? And in that context, try to analyze climate change. A fourth topic is the demand for biofuel production. Um, this is, a, I f personally find it very impressing but also very alarming uh, uh, diagram. When you look at the yellow bars, that's the demand for different um, feedstocks today for, for biofuel production. It's about 20% for sugarcane and it's about, um, say, 10% for the coarse grains. And the blue bar is for 2019, so just eight years ahead. And then it's anticipated that more than a third of the sugarcane will, will, will disappear in our cars. And for coarse grains, it's about 15%. So very high demand and a strong competition for food and feed. Um, what we're doing in projects is to estimate the production ecological sustainability of different feedstocks. I think we all agree that in the long term this is a, is a really a myopic solution, using food to process and to produce bioethanol and biodiesel. But it's a given, it's a reality at the moment, it's a political target in fact, so given that, what are then the best feedstocks? And we're producing these kind of spider webs for, in this case, nine indicators, which say, tell something about energy use, efficiency, erosion, organic matter, um, um, pesticide use efficiency, etc. Um, and then the greener the spider web, the better the performance in terms of the indicators. And in this case you can see for ethanol, uh, Sugarcane was, th was the best option in our set of crops and all palm for um, biodiesel. This is assuming good management and no land use changes. Now of course, if you change land from, from rainforest into oil palm, the picture would be completely different, at least for some indicators. But with this kind of analysis, we try to do for different crops in different places in the world. In another program, we try to estimate how family farms could benefit from biofuel production in some way without um, s um, sacrificing, without compromising um, the food and the feed production. We do that in Brazil and Mozambique. I will not elaborate on that. Final topic, it's the high prices in itself and how they may affect agriculture production in Europe. And we use for that integrated assessment methods from the Seamless project. Um, I'll give an, a brief example of two scenarios. In one scenario we changed the demand for agriculture products at a global scale quite significantly. And in the other scenario we changed both the demand and the supply. That's the red one. And the combination of the two had a particular strong effect on agricultural prices. I have to say this is with a general equilibrium, a partial equilibrium economic model. And you need to shake these models quite drastically until they start to move, because they are, by definition, computing equilibri equilibria. And what we are facing today is not an equilibrium, the high prices, but it's because of extreme events somewhere in the world, part uh, Russia or, or Australia or droughts or floods or whatever. And these are needs not simulated with this 
economic models. So this is really something important to keep in mind when, when working with these models. We took these two scenarios and we simulated how that may affect income from agriculture across Europe. And this map shows that mostly it's in this color range, so it's about 50 to 100%, 150, 200, um, one and a half to two times more than the baseline income, but there is variation across the EU. And then in the next step, we looked at regional and farming systems differences. How does it work out in different regions in Europe and how do different farm types respond? And this is two regions in France, Champagne, more in the north, and midi pyrenees in the south. And you can see that economically the income responds very strongly in both regions. But from an environmental po point of view, there are only major changes in midi pyrenees And that could be explained because of the changes in cropping pattern, which did not occur in Champagne, but which do occur in midi pyrenees You can see a strong specialization under the high price scenario into winter wheat, for instance, and, and less of other crops in midi pyrenees And that's because of the relative changes in prices which occur between these crops and then farms start to specialize or not, depending on the current cropping pattern. There's an example of using economic models and bioeconomic models or agricultural models to investigate how changes in prices may work out at different levels. To summarize, um, I strongly think, I'm convinced that we can only get a good view on what future harvest could be if we analyze options at multiple levels and in an interdisciplinary way. But just considering one or two hierarchical levels or just looking at one from one angle, one discipline, we'll end up with very blurred options with myopic solutions or with utopian solutions, but not real solutions and options for the future. So I strongly believe that integrated assessment tools, and I've presented examples of that, can strongly help us to get a sharper, a better vision on what future may bring us. And that's what we've tried to develop in the Seamless project, an EU project, um, quite big, with, with also Swedish partners, uh, in the past five, six years. Um, we, we try to translate problems into a nested hierarchical framework and address problems at each of these levels considering processes at each of these hierarchical levels by using mechanistic simulation models for each of these levels. We developed a few in the project, in the seamless project. We reused existing ones. And for instance, the Capri model already existed and I saw Turbion Janssen's name on, on one of the brochures. He's working here. He, he's a Capri expert from the University of Bonn. And then for a specific problem, we pick some of these models, we link them, and we do an integrated analysis and show diagrams, as I've shown in my presentation. And I think that's one of the ways of, of getting a better view on what's possible in terms of future harvest. Thank you very much for your attention.